Howdy and welcome back to Roundup, uh, episode two. Thank you very much for everybody who checked out the first episode. Uh, but this time we're back, uh, not in a pre-recorded fashion, thanking Snowball Esports for producing this um, for us, with us. Uh, welcome yeah. back, Luther. How how are you feeling? How good to I'm, be back? Yeah, definitely. Um, glad to be recording another episode. You know, it's been almost two weeks since we've done the last one. Um, Thursday, two weeks ago, I think was when it was, and. Uh, right now, it's the 9th of February. It's a Tuesday that we're recording this one on Tuesday night. And we're just really happy to be back, really happy to be under the Snowball banner officially. Uh, it's been absolutely great working with everyone there and um, getting out our first episode. Um, so huge thanks to everyone who supported us for the first run around. Hopefully you enjoy this next installment. 100%. Um, if you didn't check out the first episode, I implore you to do so. Uh, but Roundup is essentially our recap and everything you need to know about uh, OCE, eSport, well, Counter-Strike to be specific. Yeah. Um, and all the developments that are sort of going on in the region. Uh, we're very aware of how quickly things change. We're confident that someday something is going to change within like the short couple like window you know of hours we have to release. Uh, so we were fingers like fingers crossed. Yeah, we were like just stressing over this because like some of the stuff we have in our notes for our outline of this episode is just like okay, but what if in the time they record they announce this and that and it's just so hopefully yeah. everything we put here, uh, nothing's really changed. But if it has definitely make sure to check the comments we'll probably put up a pin comment or something like that if there are any yeah. yeah exactly um if anything massive has changed but we're pretty sure we got all the information as of so far and we're in a good spot to release this episode so yeah a lot of stuff to talk about actually um following up i mean the last episode was very much dominated by all the ESIC bands but uh this time around we've got quite a few different things that uh look away from that uh some of the stuff that we didn't get as much time to talk about in the last episode and a lot of new developments that have come forward so yeah i'm very keen and uh again huge thanks to everyone who supported us and uh shout out as well i'll i'll say right now shout out to elfish guy the man jordan mays for giving us a huge um a huge plug in his last episode of geographically challenged um we love you, content man. <laughs> That's yeah. all I'll say. If you're watching this, my only qualm very is honored. Called, me, called me Schlebu, but you know I'll let Schlebu. that one pass. <laughs> I'm 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 willing to rock it. So hey, I know uh, how it feels. No one knows how to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, classic. Um, we'll just jump into the the, yeah. the freshest, hottest thing, I guess. And for me, at least, that was Extremum. The the debut and the the snow sweet was it sweet snow the it snow sweet name. snow event. That's yeah, the one. some this very random event that popped up that not really too many people have heard of. I definitely didn't really have it much on my radar, but then I saw, hey, Extremum are playing. This should be quite interesting, and it was interesting for all the wrong reasons. Ash, I completely agree. I um, you know, I had a look at the the teams that were playing, and it's you know, you've got Taz and Neo's team, uh, Honorus, and it's like, oh, yeah, whatever. And, like, if I thought mm -hmm. about who are the, you know, the top teams that are there, it was, what, VP. Um, I kind of put Extremum in sort of the top echelons, uh, Dignitas, Ents, um, and everyone was sort of keen to see what this new God Sent lineup would do. But you looked at the field, and I, I expected a little more from... Uh, spoilers, I expected a little more from Extremum, who, <laughs> uh, after the fact, haven't actually... Uh, progressed very far, not making it out of the Swiss stage. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was a 13th to 15th place placement after going out 2-3. And look, the the teams that they versed, really, they were kind of teams where it's like the boys have absolutely taken on much bigger challenges, much bigger contenders than the people who struck them this time around. And I know that there was that interview put out uh, today by Here's the Thing, written by Taffy uh, with Liaz, where they were talking... Uh, largely about how, despite, you know, they've been boot camping with uh, Bentet and how they've been putting in the practice. But despite all that, um, even they were not at all happy with what happened in that event. And I, I for one, don't, don't blame them. Like, I know that they have all this potential to succeed and excel. It's just that the actual matches we got showing at Snow Sweet Snow didn't reflect what the boys can deliver. No, and it's... Uh... It's just tough because, like, it, a couple months ago, we obviously saw them playing, and hmm. it was different, of course, still online, uh, but North America, D2, 
different player. Uh, it was the circumstances have changed. So they weren't, you know, necessarily practicing together this whole time. And now that you're in EU and I can appreciate why they didn't necessarily hit the ground running. But part of me still just thinks this is not the level they should like. I, I just expect oh, yeah. a base level from players like Azza. Um, you know, Kassad has, you know, done wonders with this core before. I'm just a little disappointed it didn't come together again uh, immediately, especially against the field. Like the Honoris game was rough and we, we expect this sort of, uh, you know, it wouldn't be an extremum or it wouldn't be the boys if your ass wasn't clenched the whole time. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. No, no. But, That's a requirement uh, you know, for every game with them. This was, this was a little different. This just looked sloppy a lot of the time. Yeah didn't look as um, as rehearsed as they should be. And whether that's Ventet coming in or lack of practice or a whole myriad of things, we're not. I'm not entirely sure yet. But um, part of it's just going to be waiting and seeing. And and we, we'll get to see. And we're going to actually dive into this a little more in a little, a little package yeah. that uh, you're putting together. Uh, yeah, exactly. Later on in the show, we'll have a feature piece that I put together talking about specifically deconstructing the extreme games on Mirage, where I feel as if they fell short. So if you're looking forward to seeing a bit more from Extreme, definitely stay tuned for later 100%. in the episode where we'll cut to that. But 100%. we've got a bit more news to move on with as well. Um, so still in hot off the press, ANZ Champs, the announcement getting delivered by ESL a few days ago. And let's just unpack all this because there's a lot to talk about in terms of um, in terms of dates, in terms of format changes, in terms of pretty much everything going around um, especially given the context of the ESIC bands and all the stuff that's unfolded. So what do you think of this, all, uh, all these things, Ash? I think the most important thing that I saw was uh, Big Nick uh, Turtle's tweets about the format changes. Um, mm. They were the biggest takeaway for me because it's it's very different this time around um, with the, the qualifiers that start this weekend, I believe, and for the next two or three weeks, leading into the actual start of the season on May 8th. No, not May 8th. March is the next month. March 8th. Um, to which they start with a Swiss format. And it's I'm excited because the format looks good. The only issue I have is, are there going to be that many teams? It's 16 teams. Uh, I don't think we're going to have a very good quality, you know, across yeah, all the it, teams. I think it's going to be weird. Hmm. It's, it's definitely something where it's going to be really interesting to see. Because I'm kind of under the impression that a lot of the roster swaps and roster moves that we're kind of waiting on that we don't really haven't really heard much about. I think the timing is going to fit in where just a little bit before we see ANZ champs start to kick off, especially with teams that already have slots, yeah. we're going to start to see announcements being made left and right. But for the meantime, though, ANZ champs, it's going to be very interesting to see where it goes. And we'll definitely talk a bit later in the events section about uh, what we think of it. But in terms of those um, format changes, there's actually a, there's yeah. so many different things. For a start, um, having those uh, break weeks, yeah, um, such a massive change in terms of how it can impact uh, these players being able to put in that extra practice, put in that extra work to deliver some better CS. Uh, no longer we're seeing back to back um, games being played Tuesday, Wednesdays because now the dates have been moved to Mondays and Thursdays. That is um, like the biggest change, I think. That's yeah. Like super, oh, yeah, that's super, super good. For ju it's just 100%. healthy. Um, yeah. Exactly. And um, having three qualifiers, so there's three qualifiers that are starting up. Um, the first one being on the 13th this Saturday, and then the 20th and the 27th. So three Saturdays in a row, the ESCA Open qualifiers. Um, anyone can play them, don't need premium. So, hey, if you're hearing this and you want to give it a shot, you know, Get, uh, get some mates together, throw yourself together a team. There are your dates there, uh, and definitely check out the tweets for that. But it's going to be interesting to see with all these extra team slots who will make it in, because with more teams in there, there's a lot more Counter-Strike to be played, a lot more chances for these players to get themselves to this high level. 100%. And ANZ Champs, is it's always this sort of notoriously, mm. like, I wouldn't say the pinnacle of Australian Counter-Strike, but at that, like, you know, just above grassroots level, it's everyone's super familiar with it. So people people take yeah. it a bit serious. So, Well, I said uh, in I'm the last episode... To, to be good. I think I said in the last episode how I definitely see ANZ Champs as being this whole big 
uh, push from ESL in this region, how it's kind of this high tier uh, thing, because in terms of its production, in terms of the way it's being done, there's so much there in terms of it being done with these studios. So ESL as well, um, opening three new studios, getting further commitment towards uh, producing content in this region. And that coincides as well with some of their other announcements for other titles. But as well as that, they're going to definitely be using these resources for Counter-Strike as a forefront of where their creative efforts are going into. It's really exciting to see because it's very clear that ESL are looking to try and make a future for eight NZ players here and have this product done locally. So it'd be interesting to see where this next season goes with all of these big developments. 100%. Um, I think the, 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 you know, the sky's looking clear and well for the time being. Hmm. Um, moving forward, I guess. Uh, yeah. If everything on that, as much that front is that. good to go, I, I'm keen to jump into some Renegades because they're the... You know, they're not quite off the press. This has sort of been something that's bubbling for a while now, mm-hmm. but um, something I wasn't sure about was whether they would actually be able to get out of the country to make it uh, for Katowice, the play-in, and for the Pro League in Malta. Because they were announced that they had, you know, spots in both of those things. But something that was on my mind was whether or not they would need to be replaced or not. Uh, because we know that getting out of the country at the moment is uh, difficult. Um, yeah for sure but they've done it it looks like the the renegades team is currently in malta uh for the most part for the Um, most part yeah and (laughs) i think uh you know they're going to get a couple days in of prac before uh the cat of its play in starts where they're lined up to play against mouse sports we're going to get to that um oh yeah we are i'm excited to see renegades in europe after you know last year they they got their one showing in leipzig and then it was kind of you know back home they go but uh, do you think that they're going to impress a little more than Extremum do in Europe? Or Well, look, um, I think we all know that Renegades have been this reckoning force in OC for quite some time, right? But because of how disconnected we are from the rest of the scene, it's been kind of... it's It's been a really weird time where um, Renegades hasn't had this chance as much to prac with international teams. They haven't had this chance to be regularly playing these international opponents, getting these scrims in. They've pretty much just been able to scrim all the people they beat on a regular basis is what they've been going for, right? But that being said, I am at least hopeful, at least purely for the reason that I want to see them succeed, of course. Um, but the fact that there is a lot of potential in this lineup, and they've shown some very promising Counter-Strike over the last 12 months, especially. Yeah. Um, it's going to be interesting to see, and we'll talk about this one specifically, because as you said, most of the team is in Malta. Yes, but uh, yeah, this I, all I will, depends on. We will we will jump to this. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm just excited to see them sort of uh, be out of the picture in OCE because it's the big storyline was like they just kept punching down. No one could beat them mm. all of last year. So I'm not sure how long they're going to stay in Europe, right? But it should give more breathing room to everybody here at least. Um, whether yeah, it's sure. Chiefs, Order, Avant or anyone else who takes the mantle there. Um, you know, not hmm. entirely sure yet, but uh, yeah, okay, we'll stop hinting at it. Um, yeah, so obviously, let's, let's, obviously let's talk about it. <laughs> uh, with everything going on, there looks like there's some kind of domino uh, roster move thing going on here. Alistair's left Order. We don't know where he's going to yet, but Order have already filled in their roster. Um We'll get to Avant, but they've got five, it looks like, at the moment. We don't really know what's happening with Chiefs, but we all think that Ali is going to Renegades because looks like it's highly likely that Dexter is going to Mouse because Carrigan is going to FaZe Clan. So we're not entirely sure because nothing's been formally announced, but yeah, uh, that's based on right <laughs> bits and pieces, everyone seems to think this is going to happen. Um, and, you know, the nod and the, the thing that's especially funny is that Renegades will be playing Mouse Sports at their first game in Caddo. So oh, it's the most... Of course, right? It's the of most like, convoluted happen. thing that you can imagine happening. But, you know, there's people there's people checking everyone's, like, Instagram stories and, you know, liked tweets and whatnot to really confirm what's going on here. It's looking Guil- quite guilty likely. Yeah, well, look, <laughs> you know, Dexter posted this and that, so... Uh, I guess if mm. we're just assuming it's happening, what do you think? What's your your take? 
Well, for one, I'd say, um, assuming it's happening, I mean, he literally posted on his Instagram story that he was in Hamburg while the rest of Renegades was in Malta. Yeah, it's he's not helping so, his case, is he? <laughs> so, look, it looks pretty likely that it's going to happen, I think, at this point. I, I, We were talking about this, but it wouldn't be surprising if the announcement is just made in between the, the time we're recording and by the time this episode gets out. So. Yeah. You could be watching this and think, oh, this has already happened, guys. Yeah, why, why it's already it been confirmed. Why? Yeah. But regardless, assuming it has happened, this is quite a big thing for a lot of reasons. For one, um, we kind of touched on it and and we don't need to go as in-depth as we did last episode, but Dexter being the IGL of Renegades um, and then exiting and Alistair, who is not an IGL, at least from what we've seen, right, coming in, we're going to see who has to step up and take that position. What are they going to do around that? What roles are going to be played? Sicker is the Orpa at the moment, but Alistair is, well, he was at least an Orpa on order. What's going to happen? Who's going to keep the Orp? Who's going to be rifling? There's a lot of different things where we don't exactly know how the pieces are going to fit together, but yeah. it looks like it'd be quite interesting to see how Alistair would be able to play. Because it, again, Renegades are uh, the team that most often get the international stage from here if you exclude if you exclude extremum and those players yeah so it could be quite interesting to see how alistair is going to fit in this lineup and dexter over on mouse sports is a big move in the fact that it's well for one an oc player getting another big opportunity on an international team that doesn't happen every day but when it does it's a great thing for the scene because it's more of us moving up and moving on and closing that gap so a lot of different things, a lot of different ramifications for what will happen from that move. But what will be interesting is that opening match of I Am Katowice. Because having Dexter, what it sounds like, likely playing his old team in the round one match, that's really going to show yeah, not only what the new Renegades lineup looks like with Alistair on board, but also how he goes in our sports in the early days. So it's- that's going to be one to watch. 100%. It's going to be really weird because uh, I was looking over it and it's just, there's too many storylines, in fact. It's, mm. you know, Dexter, he's like our first exported IGL. Like, as who in Australia is being exported as an IGL, right? Um, but of course, it's it's Dexter to replace Carrigan of all people on the Mouse Sports lineup. And, you know, an added bonus is that Mytho is there. So there's already there's already synergy like mytha knows how he works and maybe part of that is maybe dexter and carrigan might actually have similar igl styles and that would be really cool um but it's sort of like both teams are going to be in a really weird situation in terms of you know their leader their strategy um dexter of all people is going to know renegades the best right so are they gonna is he just gonna anti-strat the shit out of them (laughs) I wouldn't um, be surprised. Who like who knows how this is gonna go? Uh, you know, language sort of barrier. He's on an international lineup now with people from all over the place. So, mm. um, I am excited more than anything to be honest. But at the same time, one team has to lose. So that's also a bit of a shed one tier. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. yeah. Um, and then after that, Renegades are also uh, playing in the EPL. So that's exciting. Um, Should they actually get through? There were some changes to the EPL uh, in terms of they want to run the the playoffs on land, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, And that's going to be the first LAN event that ESL will have run, the first major LAN event since March last year. So it's incredible that it's been that long since we've had LAN. But finally, after all this time, seeing a bit of LAN LAN CS, it's going to be a treat. Well, for one. Do you think there's a high chance, because personally I don't, that Renegades actually make the the LAN finals? At this point... I'm going to say no. <laughs> well, yeah, I would say that probably not, but it's really hard to analyze a team that you've never seen, and we haven't seen Alistair play on this lineup, so yeah. we don't exactly know for certain what can happen because there's a lot less to go off, right? Especially when you've removed that IGL um, and put him on now sports. But if anything, I think that would hurt their chances this early. Yeah. No, it should be interesting. Mouse sports are there as well. So, you know, mm. whether whether it's Renegades or whether it's just one former Renegade, hopefully one of them sees some land play that we've been craving. Oh, we can only hope, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, we've touched on some other little bits and pieces in that 
again, domino effect of roster moves, but uh, in other roster bits and pieces, um, the Avant have just sort of, I've seen nothing official, but it looks like they've completed their roster for the moment um, with the additions of Savage and Licky, if I've said that correctly. I, I'm um, pretty sure that's right. And that, I'm that sure fills that out their fifth and wrong, empty slot you know. and also replaces, uh, I think Offnu is not on their like active lineup right now. Not sure what he's doing at the moment. Um, but Yeah, we actually... did see Apoc tweet that he'd be doing full-time content creation, but don't know how serious he is about that. Um, I suppose time will tell. Yeah. Um, they just finished playing their first game, actually, in uh, Premier against... Uh, man, I should remember this. They won. Um, it was very convincing to us. So they were already off to a good start. Um, but it wasn't It wasn't one of the top teams. I should know this. I was literally just watching it. But nonetheless, they won. So, right. um, yeah, so that was a 2-0 win against Animal Squad. That there we was. Go. So it was 16-6 to uh, on Mirage for Avant and 16-4 to against that team. So already off to a pretty good start as far as uh, Premier is going for them. Uh, there were a few matches, I think, happening tonight uh, as we're recording this. So it will be interesting to see where things go. There are also going to be matches on, if you're watching this on Wednesday when we release, there's going to be three matches on that date. Uh, Silex versus Order, Chiefs versus Riot, and Manayo versus Paradox. Not sure if I pronounced that right, but hey, it's what it is. <laughs> um, fingers crossed we'll see what the Chiefs are doing as well because whether or not mm. that they've got a, another player coming in to um, prevent Yam from having to play as their coach or if they've actually got a fifth person at the moment. Um, that'll be interesting to see. Where do you, if you had to do like, you know, I guess with Renegades out of the picture, you've got the three big teams. Uh, do you have an order yet for where you, haha, <laughs> order uh, oh, of, of how you're ranking terrible. them? I know. Well, order, I'm putting I'm putting order first. Order looked the most convincing to me, and without the Chiefs lineup, I have to put them at three. So, um, yeah, I I mean I think I would pretty well agree with that. I mean, you're seeing order picking up Vexite, looking pretty strong with that lineup. Uh, Chiefs, it's going to really depend on who the next pickup is, because for the time being, they've been playing with Gump, and there hasn't really been any official thing uh, being said about whether or not he's staying on the team as a full member or what's happening with Gump, but maybe that could be happening and then they'll get a fifth so that Yam doesn't have to play. Yeah. But regardless of what happens there, Chiefs Chiefs themselves as an organization have a lot of influence in the way that they are very established within the OC scene. I saw today that their parent company, Icon, literally just raised another 1.25 million. Yeah, I think it was 2.15. It was ridiculous. Some, it was something like, okay, yeah. it was within the millions anyway. Yeah, whatever it had the many exact digits. Figure. Yeah, big digits, big digits. And there's no doubt in my mind that they're certainly going to be using this to try and put forward the best rosters that they can because that will obviously influence where they're going to be going. 100%. Um, in terms of their future as an orga- organization because organizations uh, in esports ultimately are driven by, well, for one, content and two, players. And that, because that's what most people see and they root behind. So it's going to be really interesting to see in that sense where Chiefs have had quite this history in Counter Strike and they're very much so, you know, invested and they're still staying invested in CSGO. What they're going to do from here. And yeah. it's unpredictable. We don't know exactly because the scene's been thrown into disarray by all these things, but there you are, right? Uh, no, I'm excited to see what they do because I think the best two IGLs are. Um... Val and Val's the IGL of order, right? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And and Apoc Dud, Apoc Dud is fantastic. I think he's a an excellent IGL, and that's why I've been upset that they don't have an, a a good a good core of five. Um, so regardless of who they get, uh, they just need some some time. It's Gyra. Gyra is the IGL. Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, sorry, side point. But uh, yeah. nonetheless, uh, Apoc Dud, whoever they get together, I really want to see what he can do with the pieces. Um, yeah, for maybe, sure. Maybe see him in some more ads as well, because they're all great with Mac. <laughs> um, yeah. In other news, I don't think there's any other roster moves to cover. So uh, moving forward, the, the major 2020 stickers came out. It's sort of a, we're sorry there was no major last year. Uh, but yeah. we did get some stickers. 
Yeah, it's all good and, now, um, right? We got our stickers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there's so there's a hundred thieves sticker in the game for the boys and renegade sticker in there for the other boys. Um, and they're bo- they're both in the game. All the stickers are based off RMR points of who would have been in what division starting for a proposed 2020 major, but obviously it didn't happen because of circumstances. So that's in the game. Interesting uh, fun fact as well is that in the game files was actually found a greyhound version of and they look the sticker. Sick. They look yeah, yeah they, they look, look so they look so good. And because they became part of Renegades, obviously they used the Renegades design instead. But man, that sticker looked good, right? <laughs> yeah. No, it's um I'd love that. <laughs> I've got I bought a whole bunch of the capsules, so hopefully over time, you know, my, my diamond hands they will yeah uh, <laughs> they will appreciate in value. Um the yeah. other thing that was tagged along to the yeah. uh, the major sort of sticker thing was what this major is gonna look like at the end of the year. And part of that is the RMR points. So this is how you actually sort of qualify for all the different stages, uh, the regional major ranking points. Um, That's right. And we have at home, all of them basically got reset except for Renegades. Renegades had the most. They were one of the only teams that um, finished in one of the spots. So they got reset down to 100 points and everyone else has zero. So they've got a little head start, but... So uh, the way the way they did this is that all RMR points for teams were reset, but teams that were placed as legends for the 2020 RMR standings at the end had six, got a head start of 600, challengers got 300, contenders 100, and renegades got themselves the one contenders spot that we had as a region. So they start with 100 points, and they're the only OC team with points. And then on the other side, where we look at extremum, um. They're still playing for the NA slot, even yes. though they've moved to EU. And they confirmed um, per HLTV article that despite the fact they're going to be competing in Europe for the most part, they're actually going to be traveling between Europe and NA to play the RMR events. So they have 480 points at the moment, which still uh, will give them a spot. They're down off the 600 that they were given as a legend because they took a 20% uh, deduction for JKS leaving and having to replace a Pimentet per the rules. Um, and we have one team slot be- um, at the moment because regions are allocated invites based on their previous performance at majors, but we can only go by the 2019 majors. Yeah. So that has remained unchanged. But if you haven't really been keeping on top of the RMR events, that's basically what's going on for the major qualifications. There's going to be RMR events to be announced in all the regions, including this one. So I'm sure that as that happens, we'll keep you up to date on where the RMR is going, but... Yeah, that's that's where the path to the major is for OC at the moment. Do you think it's strange that Extremum are deciding to play out of North America? Because I think mm. it's like they're not too confident in themselves in Europe. It seems like, of course, they do get a like a five hundred point essentially uh, head start, but I don't mm. know. It kind of feels like the good old days where they'd have to just beat Tai Lu and Vici to qualify for the major. Like they're sort of just smurfing in another region. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing, right? Is that they can they can absolutely do this because the current the current loophole of the rules is that RMR region because of global circumstances is just wherever the team currently is. So yeah. they're currently in NA if they take a plane over to NA to play the RMR events, you know. So I think it does have something to do with holding on to those points because it does put them above a lot of teams in terms of the fact that their performance throughout last year has given them this head start. Yeah. And that and the fact that a lot of teams are exiting NA, and so some of the the lower tier teams... Exactly. So Extremum are... They're going to have both of those things going for them, and they've clearly thought about it, they've clearly worked it out, and it seems to me as well that that seems to be what their best path towards getting a slot in the major is. But... At the same time, that's a huge pain in the ass for them, right? Having to yeah. travel between NA and EU and do all this and that. I mean, I know that like these players are used to traveling because back when lands were a thing forever ago, it feels like, players yeah. would be flying all over the world to go to all these events. But even still, um, flying for an online event has got to suck. Yeah, I know. No, it's... I don't know. I Wait and see. I hope it doesn't do anything to their... like performance i imagine it must just be shit having to go back and forward in these times 
just to win some RMR points against like oh yeah no be you sure. know, against NA teams. And worth noting as well that with uh, those things being announced, that there are now strict rules uh, where with online RMR events, coaches cannot be in the same room. They cannot be in the game. It's just five players that get to be in one room or however they're playing, but no one else is allowed in the rooms. So no coaching at RMR events that are placed online. And that certainly, I think, will have a bit of an impact on how the game is played in general, at least for the time being until we see a return to LAN. But, 100%. Yeah, for extreme, it's, yeah. I think uh, you know tactically that won't affect affect uh, extremum as much as it mm. will. I think mentally, I think Kassad offers a lot more mentally to them. Um, yeah. Sort of, you know, their hyper man. It's still like JKS wasn't a very hype dude, but they haven't really brought a very hype dude in. Like I don't see Ben Tet getting too uh, rowdy. Um, mm. So I hope that doesn't affect them uh too much yeah um things that are ongoing and affecting everybody uh in this region at least uh, is the eSIC stuff so we just thought we'd give you a quick little update um of everything that's going on eSIC ban related you might remember the whole last episode where we spoke about the 35 players who um were handed sanctions due to um betting related offenses um there's not a whole lot to really report on here other than um, you know, some tweets here and there. There's not really much else. Um, yeah. H- hit me with what's happened. Yeah, so the first and most immediate thing that has come out is that, as we said in the last episode, there would be upgraded notice of charges that would be sent out to the players. As of February 1st, the last public update that MJ Carr has put out, um, him sort of almost taking on this role of representing a lot of these players and, you know, power to him is doing he's doing excellent work in doing such um you know among the many things he's done in this scene right but the update that he put out and i'll show it on screen as well for all of you um is that uh there have been a few upgraded notices of charge received but nothing further released esic was putting work into the remaining notices to be sent out it's a big watch this space for now and he's been assured it's an operational priority yeah so the thing with that is a lot of these players are actually still very much in the dark. Over 20 more are still to be sent to these players. That's pretty crazy. But these uh, upgraded notices will include specific evidence. Like, yeah. um, instead of players being told you did a level two, here's a 24-month ban, they're going to be told uh, on X date you bet on this match and we see you on this roster, they're four. So a lot more reasoning and a lot more evidence being put forward by ESIC. But the thing is, is that it's still taking a very long time for those to be sent out. And worth noting as well, those upgraded notices are just being sent to the involved players. So as for the rest of us who weren't on that list, uh, we're kind of going to be left in the dark a bit in terms of this evidence, unless players specifically choose to share that. But given how many of them had come out and said that they're innocent and that they all this is bullshit, I feel like a lot of them will post this as many did post their first notice. So well, yeah. we'll be seeing a lot of that. So uh, a bit less direct as well, Instafrag. Uh, you might know them as the operator of the our local FPL and FPLC hubs that a lot of your favorite players play on during their downtime and play on when they want to pug, right? They are deciding to do quite the opposite thing to a lot of tiers in this region where they have no plans as of yet to mirror the ESIC bands. And so Falcon has said that on Twitter. Um, And as well as that, though, because of the obvious instability of rosters in this region, uh, direct team-related invites um, to the Pro and Challenger hubs, that's the FPL and FPLC hubs, as they're commonly referred to as, uh, will be placed on hold for uh, a certain time. We haven't, they didn't say an exact period of time, but for now they're putting them on hold. You can still qualify to those hubs if you get through the lower le- level leagues, so that's not going to affect move ups because of performance in the Instafrag hubs. But what they would do is, if you got onto a team that was say in MDL or in ANZ Champs, right, they would just send you an invite. They're not going to do that for the time being because of all this. Yeah, and just for added clarity, for anyone who either d- can't open like a tweet or uh, can't even <laughs> open like the replies in a tweet. Upgraded notices is only reference to they're not getting like worse bands. It's literally just 
they're receiving the same information they had. Yeah. In addition to this is, uh, you know, as a result of you doing X on Y date and Z is the, yeah, the outcome. Yeah. Um, it's not, no one's getting like a an upgraded, you know, plus 12 yeah, months for the time band. For the time being, yes. yeah, nothing else has happened as far as bands have gone. But it's definitely a big watch this space for all of the stuff related to ESIC. I, but... I would be interested if the rest of these notices come out and we don't see any players saying C C because mm. um, that would might say a lot about whether the the ESIC bands are like fair. But yeah, like but like as, as we saying, said, we'll see. Like, as we said in the last episode, and it was reported back then too. Some of these bans might have just been for betting on games that were international, like ESL Pro League and things like that, which I think there's a bit more of a disconnect from and needed a lot more clarity. But that's unfortunately what it might be. We don't know yet until these um, come out and we start seeing more news about it. Yeah. But it's definitely a big watch this space. This is an ongoing issue. This is an ongoing thing. And it has not just been closed off as a result of that statement getting dropped and that just being the last word. There is so There are so many things happening behind the scenes in regards to those bans. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we see some of those overturned and some of these players uh, return back to the servers before the time that they were given. You know, hopefully there will be some appeals made and things like that because, I mean, the impact that these bans has had, we don't need to go over it again, but just colossal. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, something else ongoing uh, that just started, the ESEA Premiere. I, I always, is it Premiere or Premier? Is there a way Premier, you're supposed I think. to say it? Okay, good. Pretty sure it's Premier, but um, e either way. It's uh, kicked Premier, off, yeah, formally it's happening. Um, yep. The uh, quick side note, there's a very sort of clear path uh, that they've announced again that you can get from this to uh, Pro League, and they take the winners of the current season we're in 36 off the top of my head um, or uh, 35 yeah. and then um, 36 36 and then also the winners of uh, the last season and they uh, if they're the same team then they'll just go straight to pro league and take the OCE slot and if they're a different team then I imagine there'll be some kind of BO3 BO5 um, yeah. I'm showing the graphic on screen that. now yeah. uh, that was put up in the Pro Tour blog post. But you can see here that Season 36, which we're currently in, Season yep. 37, with the ANZ, with respect to the ANZ slot, uh, the first place team from each of these seasons will go into a playoff match. So probably a best of five, I would assume, for this one, yeah. where they then get seeded into ESL Pro League. So now there has been a confirmed direct path between ESCA Premier and ESL Pro League. It's nice to Which, see, right? Like it's yeah, exactly. we're getting the love, um, especially as things, you know, the back to land sort of, you know, programs and whatnot are kicking in. So yeah, uh, it's, it's going really great forward, to see. I'm sure yeah. uh, Renegades will uh, will love to have their slot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> if time keep if things keep going the way there are anyway, that's. Um. Otherwise, uh, well, you're yeah. you're the specialist on uh, ESEA, so uh, walk walk me through uh, everything. I have been I I have been keeping an eye on Vertex uh, and what yeah. they've been doing with Soju as um, their coach standing in for the time being, because they were one of the teams obviously affected by the E6 stuff, but uh, almost unaffected in terms of their results for the time being. Yeah, no worries. So showing it on screen again here, here are the current standings as of this recording from Liquipedia, since it's pretty easy to read, kind of helps, of where Group A and Group B are at the moment. So Vertex leading the charge with a 2-0 lead on Group A with their wins, and Riot currently doing um, their best at the top of Group B. Two very interesting teams to watch as well. Um... As we said in the last episode, right, because of the fact that Premier started so soon after these bans, there definitely has been a lot of back and forth between like players um, filling for rosters and things like that. Vertex, as you said, they're up two and zero. They played against um, they played against two teams. One uh, was really weird, and I've got my notes here somewhere, but. Oops. Rooster, I think. Yeah, yeah, Rooster and really weird. I'm pretty sure were the two matches 
Um, so they were both, yeah, they were both two to one wins playing with uh, Soju, uh, who is their coach. And they're looking for a new fifth to replace Rock Walker. That's been posted publicly. They did a nice little uh, Photoshop of um, imitating a Henry G Colossus tweet with yes. a picture of Soju's face over Henry G. Love to see it. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's entirely right. It's well within the branding of Vertex, uh, if you can say nothing else about it. But currently they're doing pretty well with it, and it'll be interesting to see where they go when they finally settle down and get themselves a new fifth. Riot leading up their group uh, 2-0 start as well. And an interesting of no- thing of note was uh, that Control has had to forfeit three of their games so far because of their three players getting banned, putting them at the bottom of Group B. Again, we kind of touched about how there would be a lot of forfeits. I just didn't exactly think it would be all on one team. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, but that, they're the team that has been probably among the hev- heaviest affected, aside from, I think, Rooster, but they had some of their bands earlier. So, yeah, a lot of different things happening there. But regardless, ESCA Premier is ongoing. There's matches every week. There's, as I said earlier in the episode... Um, if you're watching this just after it airs, there'll be three matches tonight that you should definitely have a look at that we'll probably be talking a bit about, perhaps especially with that Chiefs match. Um, yeah. With where they go and Order's debut, I believe that was going to be as well. Which uh, yeah, is so, exciting. Um, yeah, because we very exciting expect, matches. We expect those three teams to easily sort of cruise through. Um, mm. You know, they're they're probably undisputed, the top three teams in the region. So for them to not show that here would sort of say a lot about them. Yeah, for sure. Um, For sure. But the other thing as well with the kickoff is that Ground Zero and Integral Nation were actually replaced by Dynasty and Ninja ESC, which are two organization names I have not heard in years. But apparently making a comeback, Dynasty actually posting on their Twitter for the first time in ages um about how they had brought on board uh nexus team which was i don't actually have it in my notes i thought i did but um they've got some pretty sharp fraggers there i believe um yeah so bz super rewind nexa and spidock hope i said all those right i'm terrible with aliases but um real sharpies nexa in particular i've seen over the years personally is just being this absolute uh, legend absolute fragger in the server so keen to see where they go with it um keen to see how so ninja i tried to suss it out from the esca page and i'd love some clarification if anyone uh associated is watching this with the fight that is going to be played but there's so many people in the esca team i just don't know what's happening <laughs> and it's like they've just got like all these people it's like it's not clear at all so that's We'd love a bit of clarification, you never actually but know what the exactly, team is. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So that's what's happened there. That was February 1st that so those changes were made. But yeah, a, a little bit of a messy season so far in terms of how it's been run. Yeah. How, but we should be seeing some interesting things coming out soon. Hopefully we'll be able to see some more interesting matches come up, especially as we get towards the uh, further end of the season as it keeps going on and on. Yeah, well, and there is a lot. We're going to be seeing... Point. We're going to be seeing LPL um, start up within the coming weeks as well. So we're going to have more matches. And again, ANZ champs we talked about before. Starting very soon with those qualifiers. Very, very in- inbound, very incoming. A lot of Counter-Strike to be played. A lot of fun yeah. stuff to watch. We almost went from like 0 to 100, right? With like, you know, league and sort of events just not happening at all to now we've got all of it. ESEA and Z champs. You know, you, you said it all there, right? Um, but mm. on top of that, we're going to have, yeah. uh, you know, Renegades overseas, potentially mouse sports to keep an eye on, complexity, uh, and Extrema. It's good to see Extrema back. Um, and yeah, we, we, we referenced it earlier in the episode, but uh, you've put together a little package. This is what the feature pieces that we referenced Ooh. last episode and at the start um, were all about. So uh, l- let us know, well, what have you put together for everybody? Right, so I put together a little bit of a video. So one of the things I noticed when I was watching those games live was that in terms of where the maps were going, the most basic map than, that most CS teams should be able to play nowadays is Mirage, right? It's kind of become this meme of this very overplayed map and you know, everyone hates Mirage, but everyone, I think, should know how to play Mirage at the very least. Extremum, other than their first debut game on Mirage and Snow Sweet Snow, 
had a bit of an underwhelming time showing us how they played that map. And there were a lot of mistakes made, a lot of messy plays being put forward. So I thought what I'd do for this uh, week's feature piece is take you in, have a look at what they're doing in the server, bring it, break it down, break down some of their mistakes and what I think they could have done a bit differently. So we're going to roll that now. Hopefully you enjoy it and uh, we'll see you back in about 10, 15 when that one's all ready. So ho hope you enjoy. Hey all, Luther here. This week's feature piece is all about Extremum and their debut during the Snow Sweet Snow event. On February 2nd, the remainder of the former 100 Thieves roster competed in their first match under the new Extremum banner and things didn't exactly go to plan. Placing 13th to 15th, there were many issues with the team's performance that could be attributed to many things, including the recent roster change of adding Bentet to replace JKS. But among the issues that went wrong for Extremum, one of the most obvious flaws in my opinion was the team's Seaside Mirage. Now, it's no secret that Mirage hasn't exactly been the strongest point for the boys. On 100 Thieves, the boys had a 36.8% win rate on this map, winning 7 games and losing 12. It was their third worst map, but not their instaban. That was Overpass. But in a meta where Mirage is one of the most common picks, I think it's a map that every CS player and every CS team needs to be able to play at least somewhat solidly. So with that, what exactly went wrong for Extreme on Mirage? Let's jump in and find out. In this segment, I'll be going over some key rounds from the event from Extreme's T side. A few examples of where they played well contrasted with where they didn't so much. Then I'll bring together some of the key takeaways from these misplays and talk about what all this sort of means. Let's get into it. Extremum versus Hanaris for map 1 in their best of 3. This match is pretty solid from Extremum if you look purely at the score. Dig a bit deeper though and you see that realistically, Extremum won the game largely on the difference in aim between the two teams. Many points in this game, there are just so many rounds where if it was a higher tier team that Extremum were playing, there is just no way these plays would work. Take the pistol round for instance, round 16. They split onto A through mid, main and palace. They get themselves a decent opening kill onto Taz and a trade onto Raiko to take the A site while up 4 versus 3. But then they play themselves in the post plan, choosing not only to bunch up far too closely, but at points overextended, take these unnecessary fights. With this, everyone goes down except Jacob, leaving him in a 1v3. Man down there, the T says Kruchik, he continues, and Jacob, he needs to clutch it. In a 1 versus 3, finds the first, will he find a second? Jacob will find him in the end, tax him, it is messy, but it works. Goes for the bait, gets the dig, and Jacob with the 1 versus 3 clutch. When his team needed it, a bit of BM as well. Luckily for the boys, he's able to outfrag Canaris and clutch the round. But remember that they almost choked a 4v3 here when they had the site and the plant. The simple mistakes of getting too cocky and taking fights as well as not playing these smarter angles in the post plants foreshadow many of the plays that we'll get into soon. Jump forward to round 19 where Hanaris have their first buy round. Extremum splits through mid and A once again and they decide to push Con to get onto site. But Jacob is overly eager and peeks just before the smoke pops as Azur and Bentet are sitting in main and palace respectively. As their teammates then push out, the push we see is disjointed and mistimed, allowing both Liaz and Grat to die. But then that leads to Bentet getting killed on his exit from Palace, as Azza is far too late to save him. What they should have done is not only use some more of that util that they had, as each of the players had Molotovs, but pushed simultaneously to maybe get some trades and possibly a plan. We see more misplays at round 23, where we see Extremum throw a full exec to A, and then run towards mid. First thing to note is that up to this point, they hadn't thrown this exec once. Selling a good fake largely involves actually doing the exec properly in previous rounds to bait the opponent into seeing some sort of a pattern, or doing it late to further sell the exec as real. Neither of these happened, and as Hanaris had taken mid, Extremum pushed straight into them, but one simply because of aim duels going towards them and not because of a smart play being made. The site was free for them to take on the exec, and it was just a wasted opportunity not to go plant. What we do see, however, is them doing the same exec the next round against Hanaris' eco round, a round where they would be more likely to stack a site, and they did do that on A. It would have been far better to run the exec on the buy round, I reckon, and then if they were to fake, they could have even done it on this round here. Anyway, let's move on to the next Mirage game.
Extremum versus Windstrike. It's the second map in this best of three against Windstrike after taking map one and dust two, 16 to two. Extremum are up eight to seven after their first half, and now it's their turn to play T side. Now on their second pistol round of the game, here's where things start to go a little bit downhill. As we're heading into the pistol, Elliant delivering two, three in fact, lightning fast. He only caught the tail end of the action, but he destroys Extremum. Nine seconds after buy time, Grad is dead. Eleven seconds. So are Liaz and Azza. What exactly went wrong here? A few things. Firstly, the call to dry swing top mid is completely misguided here, I think, given that you're potentially facing a USPS in window or in con, which we saw here. But putting three players bunched up over towards top mid where they don't have the pistol that can take the fight at range, unlike the opponent facing them, it's no wonder that Ellen got that 3k, it was practically handed to him. The most simple way to avoid this is honestly just throw a top mid smoke that allows you to get out behind cover. One player buying a smoke and flashes just could have saved this round. I mean, after this, Jacob and Bented are practically left for dead with very little ability to play off each other in the angles they're set up for. We see a decent play from Extremum in round 18, where we see a proper mid take and Liaz is able to get a good opening pick on the player pushing behind him in lows. This kill gives away that the B site player is pushed up and that there's at most one person on site, and thus a great mid round call is made to rotate B where the site is open. Windstrike chooses to save their remaining guns, with the exception of Forrester, who goes for exits with his MP9. What's important to note here, however, is that as Krad pushes A main, he catches Bentet off guard rotating from Palace through T spawn. It's incredibly obvious now to Windstrike that Bentet is just playing Palace by himself leading into the next round. Immediately in round 19, Krad pushes into Palace and lands the kill on Bentet while taking no damage. In many ways, I'm actually very surprised he only did this once this map, since Bentet being in there almost every round alone was pretty predictable and maybe he should have been punished further. But regardless, this impacts the control of the map, as now there is no A presence put forward from Extremum, and we see the remaining players start to prepare to push in from mid, and as they do so, they're cautious of Palace and use a smoke and a molly for it, as well as a molly for firebox. But Krad having changed positions over towards a main, catches Extremum off guard and enables him to get a double kill onto Azza and Jacob. Now with the rotating players on their way, Grat is stuck at triple with the bomb as Liaz has to come in from con. Grat's faction just has to hold and wait for his teammate by waiting for the CT swing. But this doesn't happen. He chooses to swing Krad and thus gives him a third kill and pretty much seals the round for Windstrike. I mean, Liaz is at 4 HP and left in an almost impossible 1v2 clutch where Windstrike play a really good crossfire, ready to trade off each other if need be. This point in the match actually made me realise that Bentet's role in playing towards Palace leaves a lot to be desired, at least from watching these demos. While it's a great idea to have a player lurking back like this, he needed to be playing more in sync with the team generally and change up his position if need be by swapping between main and palace for example for that a presence or not going alone all the time so that he could be traded this is the round that demonstrates that something's not working with that setup but nothing changes going forward we keep seeing similar mistakes and all round sloppy cs the fact that bentet died in this position is basically what give gives the round away after all because if they didn't have to be so cautious of palace and enable that control to be given then they could have had a much more cohesive push and could have been more aware of the a, a main player being there the next round now at round 20 the boys get the bomb down with three players alive but play very disjointed post plant positions there's no trading off any of these angles and where there could have been a swing from bentet to catch players off guard there's very little maybe this is nitpicking but it's clear that the boys are very off their game in this post plant as grat also panics in the 1v4 after the first kill turning to face behind him in apps not the biggest mistakes in this round but as we skip forward, we see plenty more about to be made. Round 22. We see a mid-take from Jacob, Azar, and Grat, as Liaz plays towards a main, and Bentet once again plays Palace. Three players on the CT side contest mid-control, which goes largely in their favour. We see Jacob unfortunately pull out his knife as after seeing Ellen and Con, who goes for the re-peek and lands it. A trade is make made by Azar onto Nickelback up on the short, and Ellen gets a pick onto Liaz and a main, who is caught off by unfortunate timing as he advances towards Tetris. Bentet is stuck in Palace as he's mollied off. Oh, and by the way, the bomb is in spawn. You can take the boys out of Renegades, but you can't take the Renegades out of the boys, huh? That being said, 
Grant has gotten control of Short at this point, but Bentet peeks out a palace which is swiftly punished. Azza, who is still pushing up on Khan, manages to trade, but gets himself stuck in Khan as Forrester blocks off the other side from an off-angle in window. That pick on Short was ages ago at this point, and it would have been a good point to make a mid-round call to cancel and rotate big quickly, or even at a later point once Grant actually had that short control. But it's never made. Everyone peeks out one by one, and eventually Grat is once again left in a clutch situation, which, other than a pretty nice shot on window, he can't close out. The next round, Extremum are stuck on pistols. They do a quick closed A exec, which gets them the plant. While they push a bit aggressively into jungle, they had pistols, so it made some sense to try and get guns and go for the damage after the plant. But my question really is, why did they never run anything like this with a buy round? I mean, if they had the same exec with a buy... I mean, minus that aggressive push through the smokes, I reckon they actually would have taken a round that way. Just play a decent post plan, and you're honestly set at that point. Round 24 now, and we see Azza hold W down mid for some reason. He spots a player short, but then immediately turns away and doesn't even give it a second glance. Just more general sloppiness. Like I said, there's a bunch of it in these demos. He's playing by himself here, so there's no trade potential, which is a critical fault of this setup, especially when there's often a heavy mid presence at this point from Wind Strike, CT side, Mirage. Also, time out for a second. Why is the IGL playing this position by himself? Actually, why is Azza being put in this position where he seemingly needs to act as a fragger so many times throughout these Mirage games? I mean, look, I know that IGLs can certainly frag too, but wouldn't it be smarter to have him play with the team at the very least in this case? But I digress. Even with that happening, the A push largely comes to a standstill. There's one player on site, playing under Palace. As it's clear that the players are out, but not really able to get out towards the site, Bentet is smoked off and a flash is thrown towards A main, allowing the under Palace player, Crad, to swing out off his teammate's flash and claim two easy kills plus a third on the once it picks out. Just a very misplayed round here where sloppy play allows for frags that shouldn't happen and just the general cohesiveness of the team not really meshing together right. Finally, this post plant in round 25 on B site. Won't spend much time on this one, but I just don't understand why Bentet is pushing so aggressively in market. I mean, I guess he maybe wanted the AWP instead of his M4, but it just doesn't seem worth pushing up so far for when they've already rotated over and you are leaving your teammate isolated on the site. Nickelback actually spots his gun barrel here and capitalizes off that as well. Just really poor positioning, honestly. He could have played in a much better position with the M4 and played together with Grat, but that just doesn't happen and the map ends there. Overall, Extreme puts up a very weak T side on this map against Windstrike. They not only make many, many mismanaged plays in terms of how they perform as a team, but they make many mistakes as individuals, showing a bit more of a rusty side. But unfortunately, that continues in this next map as well. Extremum versus Fours, map two after map one Inferno went to Extremum 16-13. Starting at round 16, Extremum's second pistol of this map, and we see two players just run out and take fights onto CT and triple, without even considering under Palace, a very common spot. This allows Jerry not only a kill onto Jacob, but distract Bentet as he exits Palace, enabling Flip to get a frag, followed up by another onto Azza exiting site. There is still two smokes up for Jungle and Con, and as such, it's entirely possible to try and go for a safe plant while undercover from the CT player. But for some reason, Liaz and Grad try to take the fight onto Flip in CT, but do so far too late as the rotate comes in. Not that it seems to matter, as Flit gets both kills anyway, a 4k in this round. If they'd planted alongside the better money, would have also been a better opportunity to just fall back and play the round from a post plan. So that's why I don't understand why they just went so aggressive there. Round 17 mostly goes well given the buy that Extremum has. Grat manages to get some frags with his deagle and somehow makes it across to site. Azza gets himself an M4A1S and Grat is in a position to plan it default safely. But he fakes it prompting a nade, and then he fakes it again. Then he dry peeks out. If he just planted, he could maybe go for the peek using a flash or use his smoke to get to a safer post plant position. Even if he died right afterwards, with Azza pushed up into CT, he would have had a viable post plant and a decent try to 1v2. With the bomb down, there are just so many better ways that could have been played. Let's skip to round 19. 
Jacob and Grat are pushing through Con and both throw smokes into Con where only one was necessary to get control of it. Grat tries to cross jungle and is caught out, and Jacob is luckily able to trade, albeit a bit late. But with the bomb dropped further into jungle because Grat was carrying it, he's caught out, leaving Bentet as the last player alive. Simply using one of these two smokes over on jungle would have been a far better use that would have prevented this problem. I mean, I'd assume it was some kind of miscommunication or a mistake or something happening there that wasn't as intended. But again, it seems to be evidence of just general problems in terms of playing off each other and playing as a unit that Extreme are struggling on this map especially with. I think we've seen enough individual round plays to get a good idea of what's lacking with Extremis Mirage. Let's take a step back here and look at the bigger picture instead. It's evident that the rusty side of these players is showing. Having only gone through a mini boot camp before the event, it's clear that the results and gameplay shown in this tournament leave much room for improvement. But at the same time, I fully believe that this roster can make that improvement. On paper, the addition of Bentet is a strong addition given the absence of JKS, but utilizing him fully is what needs work. The most clear thing to me that stuck up from these Mirage games is how Bentet's playstyle in Palace needs to be a bit more varied. He's rarely given that opportunity to have meaningful impact from this position, especially with the other issues going on around team play and communication. Overall, it's just about putting in the work, and I fully believe in the boys to do that. They're a team that have put in the effort before and are showing themselves to be fully committed to the role. A few hours before recording this segment and the podcast episode, Here's the Thing News published an interview with Liaz following the results of this game, and what Liaz had to say was this, quote, It happens. It was our first event as a team, and I don't think anyone has lost confidence because of it. I don't believe in expectations. We've just got to keep our heads down and the results will come. Over the last couple of years, I learned the hard way just how important it is to maintain a balanced lifestyle. When you move overseas, you commit. Your whole life is CS, for better or for worse. You can't walk away from a shit game and go and chill with your cat for a bit and things become okay again. You live and you breathe that frustration until the next game you play. I've been Luther, also known as Twosbees. Thanks for watching this week's p feature piece, and I'll see you in the next one. Awesome. Thank you very much, Luther, for putting that one together. Um, I'm no hoping worries. that we can do some more exciting sort of uh, feature bits and pieces, whether it's more like that, you know, stuff inside the server, um, getting players and members of the community on board for a chat. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential in this sort of segment, so make sure you let us know what you think, leave your thoughts, yeah. leave your love, because uh, it's excellent. I'm, I'm a big fan. That's sort of my favorite part of these shows, I think. Yeah, for sure. And um, again, we want to get more of these feature pieces out. We're looking at not only breaking down games like I just did there, but at the same time, uh, things like player interviews. So, hell, if you're a player that's currently playing in uh, in Premier or in ANZ Champs when that starts up, whenever, really, uh, don't be afraid to hit us up on Twitter. Yeah, that'll smooth, be a smooth that'll be slide a, to like plugging a, our socials. It's like the Uno reverse <laughs> card. You guys should message us for an interview. Like, you know, yeah, we're happy to talk <laughs> hey, to anyone. Hey, pitch us some content. We're happy to talk to anyone in the scene, get 100%. some stuff out. We just want to be able to showcase what OC is all for. And if you want to see a bit more from us as well, as we're wrapping up the show here, you can definitely check us out on Twitter at it's 2 sbs for me or at Shalibo for Ash. And yeah, we're keen to keep making this as well. Um, huge thanks once again to shout. Um, yeah, jumbling my words. Huge, uh, <laughs> huge shout out to Snowball. Huge snow. Of uh, course. Huge sh shout out to Snowball for bringing us on board. They've been absolutely fantastic to work with, and releasing under them and having them, um, having us under their wing has definitely been something that we've very much enjoyed a huge amount here. Uh, over at Roundup, so very, very keen to keep making this show. Uh, current plans at the moment are releasing on Wednesdays, roundabout, with a new episode every two weeks. So bi-weekly schedule for you all to have plenty of news, plenty of things to talk about. So yeah, definitely make sure to stay tuned for some more Roundup, and we'll yeah, thanks for watching. I suppose. Yeah, thank you Anything very much. To say? No, I think I think that uh, nailed it. Make sure, yeah, make sure you're subbed. Make sure you're checking out I, uh, all I the links subscribe. and whatnot will be down in the uh, <laughs> down in the thing. You know, check out Snowball especially. Lots of um, you know, lots of Valorant and League content on there. But the CS content has really been, uh, at least for me, a focus to sort of mm. expand the library of everything that's going on. And that's also we reflect that in this show, expanding on everything that's going on uh, from our perspectives back to you 
So yeah, thank you very much for checking out Roundup and stay tuned for episode three in the in the, the coming weeks. <laughs>